Okay, chapter 12, part 4. We're going to look at the nuclear family. I'm going to speed up just a little bit because we're not going to cover a lot of this for the final. Um, Marisol, really interesting artist um, from Venezuela. And this is from 1962. And she's using some found objects here, some actual shoes um, and some wooden doors and segments of wood that she found. So they're blocks of wood, and she's commenting on um, how the family that she knows of um, in Venezuela does not look like the nuclear family um, that you see, the affluent U.S. you know, uh, nuclear family, meaning two point uh, was it two point two children? I don't know exactly how you have that point two. Um, but the idea that you have two children, man, a mother and a father, and it's just this certain way, and everybody's doing great on U.S. television in 62. Now, 62, we're still in that idealized 50s state uh, where postmodernism, sorry, modernism is holding sway and everything is great and everything we're doing is perfect. That is the mentality in the U.S., and... Um, you know, plastics and, and everything that is invented is good and it's embraced and you must have a bigger and better thing all the time. That's still happening. So that's what's getting projected all around the world and that's her comment on it and what her people really look like her in her area of the world in Venezuela um, with uh, different garments and perhaps a lower income with farmer, you know, his kind of got dirt on his overalls kind of thing. So, Sally, Sail Baby, we we'll get into with Elizabeth Murray. It's an abstract painting about family life. Um, so, the rounded cabinet, canvases are suggesting infants or children and bright colors for childhood. Baby Makes Three. This is a really goofy piece that I, I find it kind of disturbing, quite honestly. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's kind of humorous where... Um, uh, so he's the general idea is, is to present a homosexual approach to the nuclear family, but the work pokes fun at the the idea of a happy nuclear family, and um, how gays and lesbians recreate family and social structures. But basically, it's it's kind of all pictures of himself for different age and different ages, and there uh, that's what makes me laugh about it. I think it's it's kind of um, goofy with those little rosy cheeks. All right, class is another one that we're going to get into, and um, you couldn't really get any more intense class differentiation than you could with the Egyptians, the pharaohs being at the top, that we're looking at this temple of Ramses, um, and then, uh, of course, there were slaves at this time, uh, so this is, you know, 3,000 years plus ago, and all the stuff that were built, like the pyramids and everything else the Egyptians did, were built by slaves. But what we're looking at is the depiction of the ruling class versus the working class in this case. And um, we have, uh, you know, these distinctions of how the pharaohs are depicted. And we've looked at a number of these things, very organized and staid. And, of course, they're quite large here. So the body was dis is sculpted in different ways, and again, we're looking at these uh, hierarchical scale. This guy is super large. These other uh, figures are not as important. That is one element of this, but there's a standardized way that you're going to depict the ruling class. Enormous, he's semi-divine. Um, what else? The seat is posed, frontal, composed, symmetrical, expressionless face, and the body is flawless. He's always in his youthful prime, regardless of what time he died or, you know, if he was a small child and he was ruling the country, they would still depict him in this way. Very costly production. Then, in some tombs, which later uh, has been discovered, um, which is really interesting because you think of the Egyptians only with this one style, which is fairly true. But when rulers were buried, often they were buried with images of their um, workers, with the people that worked for them. And this guy is a scribe, and a scribe is a, is a long-standing tradition before there were 
uh, copy machines, right, or anything digital, somebody had to write everything down and then um, perhaps copy it to send it to somebody. So this is a scribe, and he is not in this traditional Egyptian posture, right? He's he's shown in a flawed, aged, kind of sagging way, and his legs are crossed, and um, this is this was like a big uh, revelation to find this thing, and he's only 21 inches high. He's tiny, okay? But different people doing different kinds of tasks were shown in Egyptian tombs, and he's less expensive, and he's less eternal and permanent, right? He's more lifelike, realistic looking. Um, idealized images as well with Emperor Justinian. Now, if we think about this a little bit, this is the Byzantine Empire, and we're getting toward um, a more religious um, culture in, in the West, and what everybody is starting to look elongated and otherworldly. They don't look re as realistic as they did in uh, ancient Greece and Rome, and we're into the Byzantine Empire here, and I'll get more into that. Um, eh, what else do I want to say? Okay, so they're idealized. They have a certain uniform. It almost looks like the same person throughout, so they are idealized, and they all kind of look in a similar way to indicate that they're leaders. This is a really interesting piece, Las Meninas, um, uh, Velasquez. He is an incredible painter, and um, 1656, he influences a lot of people, including Picasso, um, through the years. But this is one of his most famous works, and this is recording a lifestyle. So we have class activities and lifestyles. He was able to get sort of a snapshot of the royal family and also the interior of the room. I mean, this is such an interesting, weird painting. And him painting the canvas um, as we're here. It's sort of a self-portrait. It's a bunch of things. But this is the Spanish monarchy at the time, 1656. And only the wealthy could afford oil paintings um, made of them. And this is huge. It's 10 feet high. And this is at the Prado, another place that you really need to go in Madrid. Absolutely amazing museum, nine feet wide. And it's called the Maids of Honor. So you see a dwarf girl here, a woman actually, I'm sorry, and a, and a girl and the dog. And there were all these attendants to our little Infanta, Margarita. She was really important. She wasn't painted with a crown. But we understand that she's exalted because she's in the middle She's brightly lit. Her white dress is catching all the light from the window. Um, and then the servants are all focused on her. So we know that she's the focal point here. She's the one, the heir apparent, literally. All right. The swing, we're getting back to our rococo, our softness, if you will. Um, but this shows the leisure class the wealthy, privileged, had few responsibilities. They had nothing to do all day, every day. So they invent games. So I hate to tell you the truth about this, but our sports culture and um, things like ping pong and <laughs> going on a porch swing and all kinds of stuff, a lot of that stuff evolved out of this time frame um, that we still see today. But look, she's tossed her shoe off because... You know, she doesn't need that. Someone will take care of her. And here's this gentleman pulling the swing. She's not even swinging herself, for crying out loud. Beautiful, soft um, foliage. It just gets so feathery and soft and pastel and delicate to the point of, like, uh, it almost seems like it's going to float away. There's very little reality happening here. You know, it just is very soft and sweet. So this is a bead workers of the um, Andonesia family of Efon Alaye. This is a beaded crown. Um, and different African cultures, the uh, chief or the head person would wear something similar because you want to keep flies off of him. And this is there are also other fly whisks. We don't see it here. But there are other things. If you think about this hot climate, um, 
that you can have a lot of flies and things like that. So you want to keep that off of this, this personage um, altogether. So you have these beaded um, crowns. So rulers in many cultures are often wearing crowns or elaborate dress. Um, and then there, it, this is a high-ranking chief in this case. Shape of the clothing, headgear, materials of, and use of decorative symbols.